What happened to Bosnia and Herzegovina during the Second World War? What is today Bosnia and Herzegovina was during the Second World War a part of the independent state of Croatia. What exactly happened here in Bosnia during the Second World War? Well, this here is another Countries in World War II episode where we're going to talk about Bosnia during World War II. Hey, good to have you back on the channel. If you're new, I'm Stefan. I'm a Dutch history teacher and I like to cover history on location. Right now, I'm overlooking Sarajevo. And if you find this on location content interesting, consider subscribing, hit that notification bell, and you can support me via Patreon, PayPal, or via a super thanks. The links can be found below in the description. So what is today Bosnia and Herzegovina was during the interwar years a part of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. In the region Bosnian Muslims lived, also known as Bosniaks, but also many Serbs and of course Croats. During the 1930s the Yugoslav government redrew the Bosnian map by dividing the territory into different provinces, Banats, and removed the traces of the old Bosnian borders. In 1939 the Cetković-Macic agreement, known as the Sporazum, made a special Banovina of Croatia, but there was nothing of a source for Bosnia. The next border change merged Bosnia with Croatia and that happened after the Axis invasion of Yugoslavia that commenced on the 6th of April 1941. This state became known as the independent state of Croatia and had around 40% of the territory of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia that was now defeated by the Axis. The reason why Bosnia and Croatia were merged was that the Axis wanted to break Bosnia away from Serbia and Serbian influences. Serbia proper, which became known as a Serbian residual state or basically what was left of Serbia, mostly came under German occupation. There was also a puppet state there led by Milan Njedic, but it had barely any influence. Now who had influence was the Ustasha. The Ustasha was the party that ruled the independent state of Croatia, which was an Axis puppet state. Now this movement was led by Anta Pavlic and it was known as the Ustasha, the Croatian revolutionary movement. Its ideology was drawn from German Nazism, Italian fascism, but also authoritarianism and peasantism. Basically, Ustasha ideology can be summed up in three words, and I'm talking about racism, religion, and violence. And the Croatian ultranationalists, they saw their state was for Croatians only, and people they deemed inferior, Serbs, Jews, and Roma they had to disappear. Many died at the hands of Ustasha death squads that roamed the countryside, killing people in the most horrifying ways imaginable. Others were sent to concentration camps, such as the Yasenovac complex, where many would be brutally murdered. Also, Croatians with other political IDs were murdered in Yasenovac. It is believed that around 80,000 died in the Yasenovac complex. One Ustasha member uh, was about to kill his Serbian acquaintances and spoke the following words to them. I know who you are and how you are, but I can't help you. I can't help the fact that you are Serbs, that you belong to the people among whom the new laws of the state make no distinction. You're all guilty for what happened during the time of former Yugoslavia. You will pay for it, every one of you, down to the last. Many people were murdered with knives, bayonets, axes, people were burned alive or buried alive. Now for those who weren't targeted by the Ustasha, life wasn't easy because the NDH suffered economic hardships due to axis exploitation. Food shortages and inflation led to the rise of black markets. One thing that confuses many people is why did the Ustasha hate the Serbs but not the Bosnian Muslims? I mean the Serbs they were orthodox but they were at least Christian right? But the Muslims they were um, well, Muslim. So why weren't they targeted? Well, that was because they hated the Serbs because the Serbs had, well, oppressed them for so long during the time of the Yugoslav Kingdom. And the Bosniaks, the Muslims, they were basically seen as cross of the Islamic faith. And the idea was that one day these people would be converted to Catholicism. The Ustasha movement is unique in that it was the only fascist group 
from that era to have a significant Muslim component and military uniforms that included the Fez. And it is true that a certain amount of Bosnian Muslims joined the Axis, either in the Croatian Home Army but also in the Waffen SS, the SS Hansha and the SS Kama. On the request of the NDH authorities, the Mufti of Jerusalem, Amin Al Husseini, was invited to help recruiting Muslims. And these units helped the Axis with anti partisan warfare in the country because the NDH had a huge problem with rebellion. Now according to historian Stephen K. Pavlovich, the first resistors in Axis occupied Yugoslavia did not start out of ideology, it was basically out of survival as local priests and merchants armed themselves to fight against the Ustasha. It soon however took on an ethnic bias. Now basically there were two main resistance groups in Yugoslavia during the Second World War. The Chetniks, led by Draža Mihailović, who were more na Serbian nationalist oriented, and the communist oriented partisans that were led by Joseph Broz Tito. Now, eventually, the Chetniks, to some degree, started to collaborate with the Axis to fight against the partisans. It's a complicated story, which I covered in another video. Both started their operations in neighboring Serbia. Soon, the resistance fighters moved into Bosnia, part of the NDH. In the following years, the Axis carried out several huge offensives against the partisans. And according to Yugoslav historians, these actions became known as the enemy offensives one to seven. The first enemy offensive was in September to December 1941, where Germany and Italy recovered territory taken by the partisans. The second enemy offensive occurred on the 15th of January 1942, where German and Croatian forces advanced through eastern Bosnia, making Tito retreat and form the mobile proletarian brigades. From April till June 1942, the third enemy offensive took place, where German, Italian, Croatian and Chetnik units attacked Tito's position, who then marched 200 miles to the northwest of western Bosnia. The fourth enemy offensive occurred on the 15th of January 1943, where German, Italian and Croatian units executed Operation White 1, 2 and 3. Tito managed to break out, fighting his way southeast, reaching western Montenegro. The fifth enemy offensive occurred on the 20th of May, where Tito was surrounded again and made it back to eastern Bosnia, ordering his troops to disperse. In the autumn and winter 43-44, the sixth enemy offensive took place, known as Operation Kugelblitz, which was launched, and the Axis forces took Tuzla and Bihać. And the last one was the seventh enemy offensive, which occurred in May 1944, where the German used paratroopers and Tito barely escaped. Now do notice at some point the Axis were assisted by the Chetniks. The Chetniks was a very diverse and decentralized group, as historian Misha Glenny wrote. The bulk of Chetnik forces, on the other hand, were attached not just to specific districts, but to individual villages. Their tactics were defensive aimed at maintaining local freedom of action. As such, the Chetniks were not highly organized or flexible. Although most paid lip service to Mihailovic as their leader, they did not consider themselves bound to him. If they did not feel like leaving their villages on a mission, they would not do so. Many Chetniks viewed the war primarily as an eliminationist opportunity, killing thousands of Muslims in eastern Bosnia. The Chetniks often clashed with the partisans, and by the autumn of 1943, the partisans had decisively weakened them. Italy's collapse in September that year also sapped the strength of the Chetniks. The ability of the partisans to unite all Yugoslavia not only gave them a military edge over the Ustasha and Chetniks, but also meant that they were able to exploit their victory to a moral sense for many years, giving them greater political durability. Now many Chetniks went over to the side of the partisans. See, the partisans made no distinction between nationality. Everybody was welcome to join. Reckless tactics resulted in the death of 300,000 partisans out of a million fighters. But at the end, they did prevail. Now do notice that the partisans did commit purges and atrocities as well. They certainly showed no mercy at the end of the war to those who collaborated with the Axis, as for example is shown the Bleiberg repatriations and subsequent massacre. Sarajevo was taken in April 1945 and the following month Zagreb was taken. The last battle that took place here was the Battle of Otsak that took place in late May 1945. Altogether, 75,000 Bosnian Muslims are thought to have died in the war at 8.1% of their total population. Muslims had fought on all sides, Ustasha, German, Chetnik, Partisan, and they had been killed by all sides. They had not started this war and had fought above all to defend themselves. 
After the war, Bosnia and Herzegovina became one of the six constituent republics of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia that was led by Tito. It's important to note that the events in Bosnia and Herzegovina during this period were marked by intense violence, ethnic tension and wartime atrocities committed by the various factions. The scars of this conflict would continue to shape the region's history in the years to come. And it led to violence in the 1990s during the Bosnian War. Big shout out to my patrons, you see their names on the screen right now and a special thanks to Jesse, exactly. Thank you Jesse for your super thanks, which is also a way to contribute to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, check out the Croatia right here and the playlist for countries in World War II here and uh, best wishes from Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina. <laughs>